Welcome to the Inner Huddle, a youth football development podcast for parents, coaches, and managers of young aspiring footballers. Your hosts from Pezza Street Soccer are Pez and Jeff. Hello and welcome to the Inner Huddle. As usual, I'm Pez, he's Jeff, and we're joined today by former professional footballer Andy Reid. How are you both doing? Good, thanks, Pez. Very well, thanks. Mm-hmm. It's great to be here. Great to catch up with the with the two legends <laughs> that I've heard so much about. Excellent stuff. We're on location today, aren't we, Jeff? Yes, we're at Serum Academy in Salisbury on a holiday course. So it's a, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Not uh, being in the studio and being Not out in the usual about. place. Out Excellent. Of our zone. And why are we at Serum Academy, Jeffrey? Uh, for the first time ever, we're doing an elite training camp for school years six to ten. Ten, yeah. yeah. And we're very fortunate because we've got Andy Reid here. Yeah, so Andy's come in today to do a bit of Q&A with the kids, which went very, very well, so thanks for that, Andy. And you're doing some coaching tomorrow, aren't you? What have you got planned for the, the kids tomorrow? Um, well, obviously, I know the, the, the futsal, futsal style stuff that, that, that you've worked on, so um, you know I'm quite keen to to retain some of the stuff that you do and maybe add some more game-related stuff into that. So there'll be some passing drills, um, a little bit of um, possession and, and then it will lead into a, into a directional game. I think it's very important that um, you know that that we continue to develop the skills that, that that the players are learning within your within your academy and within your all the stuff that you're doing. So I'm quite keen to focus on that and also add a bit of the uh, the, the game stuff onto it. So we're sort of adapting it to get your key points and your philosophy that you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, very much so. I mean, that's that. You know, obviously, I've got my ideas. I've got all these things that, that you know that I want to get out, and that I that I want to get across. So there'll be things that, that I want to do. But, but I'm very very conscious that I'm working within a structure as well of the stuff that you're doing. So I think the two will go hand in hand. I think it'll work really well, and hopefully the players will benefit from the expertise that I can bring. Really looking forward to that, aren't we, Jeff? Yes, um, great opportunity for the kids, and one that you don't often get, do you, to be coached by ex-Premier League and international player. And we'll talk a little bit about your career before we get into our normal format with some of the questions that we've got. Um, let me see if i got this right. Nottingham Forest, Spurs, Charlton, Sunderland, Forest, with loan spells at Sheffield United and Blackpool. And I'll be honest, I had to uh, Wikipedia this. Um, 29 caps for Islander. I always thought it was 26. You sneaked in a few well, more at the no, end there. No, well, it was 27 until... Uh, it was 27, and I had uh, a fallen out with uh, Giovanni Trapattoni uh, at 27. So um, for, I didn't get any caps for probably about five years while he was in, uh, while he was in charge. And then when Martin O'Neill took over... Um, he brought me back into the squad, and was I got and I got Germany game, wasn't it? Was it well, well, Ma- Martin, uh, there, there was um, uh, yeah, it was the Germany game when when, when we were away. Uh, we played away to Germany, and then um, and then those two games. Then I played uh, another one. Then I played against um, Kazakhstan, maybe I think it was. That little spell out was that probably the best spell of your career. Did it coincide with? So it was unfortunate for Ireland that. You weren't wearing the green jersey. Yeah, well, listen, I was playing really, really well at the time. There was a difference of opinion between me and the manager. Uh, listen, that happens in football sometimes. You know, not all managers like all players and not all players like all managers. I wasn't the type of player that, that, that fit into his style, into his way of playing. Um, so, we you know, we, we ended up having having a bit of a, a bit of an argument about it. And um, but but that's listen, that happens in football. So there's no point in. Uh, I didn't dwell on it. I was disappointed, and it was it was tough to take uh, very early on in it. But after that, I just thought I can't control it. I mean, I remember talking to Des Walker about it, and he said to me, he says, "Really, don't worry about it." He says, "The time that you need to worry about it is if you get called back into the squad because then you have to perform. Yeah. At the moment, you, you you're, you're not in the squad, so there's nothing you can do about it. All oh, you can do is con- yeah, tell you yeah. control, concentrate on foot on, on your club football." and let the rest take care of itself and that's what I did and, and that was a very good conversation for me to have because because after I had that conversation it almost you know made me realise well you know this is the way it is you just have to deal with it Would you say that those two caps that you got after that little spell out were more special though because yeah. you knew what you'd been missing Yeah, yeah the, it was nice I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that my international career didn't finish on 
the 27 on, on the fall yeah, now yeah. and on the 27 uh, cap so so to get them extra two after that were, 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 were really nice yeah cool well i know you're a regular listener to the show of course, of course. so you'll be fully aware of the format we uh, have approximately 20 questions a show we don't always get through them do we jeff um yeah, quite often we don't <laughs> sent in from people to the radio show um to us personally it's a little bit different today because a lot of them come from me because obviously i've known you for quite some time we met at charlton 12 years ago or something yeah, so it's a long time uh, there's a few in here that i've always wanted to know about and obviously we had to do with children's football development and personal development um so a lot of them are tailored towards that we'll try not to uh, go through you know so structured, we'll see where it goes, but we will read them out. Um, and I'll kick off question number one, and this was one of mine. Um, where did your love of the game stem from as a child? Well, I was very fortunate that, that I came from a football family. Um, my dad played League of Ireland football for St. Patrick's Athletic over in Ireland, and he was actually a very good player. So football was in my family from, from, you know, from a very young age. I remember going to watch my dad play. Um, and you know we'd, we'd always be playing out in the garden playing out in the street and which is what kids done back then so uh, my love from the game you know and um, my passion from the game came from my family came from my dad in particular uh, and, and it grew from there excellent so a lot of these questions will start merging into each other as we go along because You've answered a little bit of the second one already. Um, a lot of professional players I have worked with in the past believe they were born with a certain amount of natural talent. Um, but when we've chatted further, um, it's become apparent that they usually share similar traits of falling in love with the game early and getting in countless hours of practice with the ball at a young age, sort of playing with friends, family, out in the street. Um, where do you sit on this nature versus nurture debate? I'm sure we've had this de- debate before, and it stems from... I was always into... My coach, and even you know, when I was at Charlton in the medical side of things, I used to speak to people like Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank and try and tap into how they became um, or got to the level that they did. And to start with, they're all quite, I was born with it, it was natural. But then when you talk to them a bit further, it's like, oh no, I always had a ball at my feet, I dribbled to school, I slept with my ball. And you think, well, actually, you were getting practice in without even realizing it. So I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, well, my view on it is, is, is that I think modern day uh, society restricts kids from not, uh, kids are restricted from going out and playing out in the streets now. They've got so much else going on. They've got computers, they've got this going on, they've got that going on. When I was a kid, we went out in the street. We'd be sat in uh, on our summer holidays, and if we weren't doing that, and my mum would say, get out from under my feet. <laughs> so when you went out, went out, you took your football with you. You went up to the local park or you went out to the street, you put down two jumpers either end and you had a game of football. Yeah. Playing my play from the street across around. And that was where you start to develop your craft. Yeah. There's no coaching involved in that early age because I really firmly believe at that early age from six, seven, eight, you need to let kids express themselves and let them find out what they can do and what they can't do. And, you know, you can point them in the right direction, but you get it from going out on the street and how can I get past this player? He might be a couple of years older than me, but how can I find a way to get past him to score a goal? That's figuring things out yourself. Mm. It's problem solving for yourself. That's why we came up with the name street soccer for for Pezzers, wasn't it? Yeah, and there's there's something about the the street play where it's free play and the different age groups and different abilities that I think allow different players to find their role within football sometimes. So you've got your little tricky winger will probably avoid playing down the middle of the pitch where all the big players are and lumping it forward and things like that. And but that's problem solving yeah, in itself. Because it's he kno- been he, taken away a bit, hasn't it? Well, it has been because he knows that if he stands in the middle of the pitch, he's not going to get a kick. Yeah. And the same way, and I related to you know, things that I learned, I wasn't the quickest player, but I always felt I could make a difference in the game. If I was playing against a fullback, who was really, really quick. I knew that I wasn't going to get the ball and go past him and beat him on the outside for pace and get across in. So I had to find different ways to give him a problem. Now, how can I give him a problem? OK, I'll go and stand inside. Now I'm giving. Now, instead of, instead of him being able to see me and he knows that he's quicker than me, I'm looking at him and I'm saying, right, come and mark me now. If he comes and marks me, my fullback will overlap. The fullback will give him a cross. 
that's figuring out, that's solving a problem. So do you think there's a problem now with sort of overcoaching? Because a child nowadays uh, uh, is not allowed to play on the street or... At an early age, things. I do. At an early age, I do. I think kids need to be allowed to express themselves at an early age. And when they start to find themselves a little bit, and like, uh, like what you said there, that, that finding their roles within the game, then you can start to nurture that. And then the coaching can come in. And then you can kind of say... You know, oh, well, maybe you could try this, or maybe yeah, you could try that. But fine tuning, maybe what we've what, learned yeah, already, that's, uh, naturally, uh, by love of the game well, and playing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, and that's where, them early stages is where you develop your love for the game. You don't develop your love of the game for somebody telling you what to do, because no, when you're a kid, you don't want to be told what to do. You want to be able to express yourself. Well, if somebody says to you, "You have to go and stand there, and you have to do this," you don't like that as an, at an early age. But when you go to the park and when you're playing a game against. 10 kids from around the street and you've got all your mates playing with you, you can run wherever you want. Mm. And that's how you find out where it is. And then, and then when you get all uh, put the structure in then. And then you say, right, well, you can't run where you want now. Now you need to hold your position. But teaching by them the game then, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. You're teaching them, yeah, 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 that's exactly what it is. You're teaching them the game and how the game works, positional sense. How can I walk this in a structure? Because what, you know, one of the big hates we have, Jeff, is... Nowadays, if your child is showing a love of the game, in fact, we just had it a minute ago, didn't we? Someone who works here came in, my child's obsessed. Um, and really, nowadays, they don't play on the streets. So the only opportunity is you, you Google your local team, you take them along, and then you're at the mercy of that one coach. You might be someone's dad. Um, and you might be one hour a week with them. And it's not enough to yeah. develop... I, I, I firmly believe that, that you know the, the FA, um, uh, the government, and it's not just here. I find it over in Ireland now. I'm, I coach with Ireland's under 18s now, and people keep asking me why are the, the players not coming through that we had before. And I, I, up and, and I really do believe it's because I, I believe I believe spaces, pitches, safe areas for kids to be able to go and play need more of them need to be created. Yeah, and that, that that's come from that will have to come from the government. And not to be locked up as well, because they always seem to have lock and key. Yeah, yeah, yeah lock it up. And but but, but that's, that's got to come from the government. It's got yeah. to come from the FA, because that's where kids start off and find their love for the game from. So more needs to be done, I think, by the FA and and, and, and by the government, by the Irish FA and by the government. And, and that's not having a go at them. I'm, that's yeah. something that I you know they, they do a lot of great work. The FA do a lot of great work. Yeah, you know, yeah, the FEI do a lot of great work, but I think that's an area that they can really, really focus on. One of the reasons why I found um, part of the reason why I fell in love with the game, Euro '88, watching Ireland play in Euro '88, yeah, yeah, watching Ireland play in 1990, mm -hmm. that made me want to go out and play football even more. So they're the type of thing, uh, they're the type of things that that that, that, that need to be walked at, need to be nurtured a little bit, need to be taught about a little bit more. Right. Do you want to read question number three, Geoffrey? Yep. You come from a part of the world that has produced its fair share of good footballers. Why do you think that is? It has produced quite a few, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ireland well, well, and Dublin well, in particular. Well, uh, Dublin in particular, and, and I was only talking about it the other day, and, and it goes back to my point where I said there, uh, Ireland had a really... Ireland beat England in Euro 88. Mm -hmm. sorry, sorry for bringing that up. Ray Houghton, was it? Yeah, Ray Houghton yeah. scored a great header. Uh, and then Ireland went on to get to the quarterfinals in 1990. Now, that inspired a generation of players. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we had people like Robbie Keane, Damien Duff. Roy Keane was a little bit older than that, so maybe not so much him. Shea Given, um, Stephen Carr, Richard Dunn. You know, we had some, some mm -hmm. really, really good players who had really, really top-level careers. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I fall into that category in respect of that was what inspired me as well to go and play football. So uh, I think that's part of the reason. Euro 88 and, um, and, and, and Italian 90 were, were, big, um, were big influences on creating that generation I played for, for, for the Republic of Ireland. But once they've had that inspiration, there was, from what I can gather from talking to you and your family, there's pretty good competitive 
youth setups in Dublin. You Cherry Orchard, weren't you? And there's a few other. Yeah, setups. I mean, I played for Cherry Orchard, and there's some, you know, there's some big clubs over there. You know, it's Home Farm is a big schoolboy club as well over there, um, and, and they were always very, very competitive. Lots and lots of players came out of these clubs, and you know, and we were playing in a competitive league from a very, very young age, which was which was great, and it helped us, helped us massively when we moved over to England because we weren't kind of going from playing against rubbish players every week where we were beating everybody 10-0 to all of a sudden going against playing against good players. We were going from playing against good players to playing against good players. So uh, that stood us in really good stead. The schoolboy system over in Ireland has, has been very, very strong for a long time. OK, so that leads us into the next one. So talking to good players, question number four. Someone's asked, why do you think you reached the level you did where others might have failed? Um, I think mentality is, is is a big part of of, of where a lot of players don't don't play. You know, you need a you, you need a tough mentality. You know, you you really do need a tough mentality to um, to succeed in football. People think it's easy. Oh, it's not easy. We always say, don't we? There's so much more to to becoming a footballer than being just good at football. Of course, there's so you know. many sacrifices that you need to make. You know, and people just see it when you run out on a pitch on a Saturday when you've made it into a force team and you're playing well and if you score a goal and everybody's cheering and say, oh, look, that's great, isn't it? They don't understand all the tough times. They don't understand moving away from your family when you're 14. They don't understand, you know, setbacks that you come across, injuries that you might pick up. All these things are part of football. that are really, really difficult times that you have to have a strong mentality to take. So... You know, we spoke about psychologists and, mm -hmm. and, and the work that they're going to be doing with the kids that you have got. I think it's vital. I think it's very, very important. You work on, on technique. You know, you work on fitness. You work on all these things. And all these things that make, the, make a tick are, are your brain. Yeah, yeah. So you should be training your brain. Yeah. It's very, very important. And, and it's really, really good that you're doing that. And so I think that's mentality would be... Uh, I have always had a very strong mentality. I've always believed that, you know, that I could make it, that I could succeed. If you break that down more specifically into a game, I always believed that as an attacking player, I'll create something. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not having the best game that you've ever had, I'll create something. Got a little bit just of that coming that, up later as well. Just, one just, just, just give me that one, one, that one opportunity. Great answer. Right, and it leads in very nicely to the next one. Um, I've seen recently that you've talked about the lack of Irish footballers playing in the Premier League compared to years gone by. Is this a worrying trend or just a natural cycle of things? I think it's probably in the middle, okay. um, I would say. Um, it's, it's a natural cycle, as in, i say Ireland, when they had the, the generation of Robbie Keane, Ray Keane Shea, given Damien Duff, players like that, it was somewhat of a golden generation. You don't always get a golden generation. You know, so that's part of the natural cycle. It's a worrying trend in the respect that you don't want to see that decline in players. No. Um, and it's a bit of a wake-up call, you know. We need to, we need to start investing in, in, in investing time and money in, in young players, in, like what we spoke about earlier, creating safe environments for them yeah. to be able to, to develop that love of the game. To be fair, though, most countries do go through this kind of barren spell at some point from yeah. with Germany, Brazil, Spain, they've all had them, haven't they? They have. Uh, so, so, so that's it's, what I'm saying. It, it, it's, it's not over panic yet. It, it's, it's, I'd say it probably falls right into the middle of, of, of those two that you said there, worrying trend, natural cycle, does a little bit of both. There's a little bit of a link with Spurs there. I'm a big Spurs fan, so I, was, I love <laughs> watching you play. But um, if, if one gets in at one club, do you then speak to each other and say, come and play for... Does it work a bit like that in football at the top level, or is it, yeah, or is it always go for an agent and done properly? No, no it's definitely oh. not always done properly. That's for sure. Um, you know, it can happen in a lot of different ways. You know, you can it can be a manager that you played for before wants to come and sign you. It can be a coach at the club that knows you from somewhere else and he recommends you to the manager, one of the players. There's so many different ways for things like that to happen. Okay, you are involved with Republic of Ireland under 18s, which. We've already talked about, and we had uh, some great stuff with the kids earlier in your Q and A with them. Um, is there a healthy stream of young players coming through the system, and is it easier or harder now, would you say, than in your day when you came through? I mean, I've just written here. Obviously, there's a lot more scouts out there nowadays for people, more opportunities to get noticed. But the standard of the Premier League is so high, you have to be of a really yeah, top quality. Yeah, you do. The standard is so high. There's a lot of money being spent, so there's not as much of a focus on youth development. In, in the Premier League as what there has been because 
clubs want a ready-made player now. They want somebody who's you know who's ready to come in and do a job Saturday. So they sign them on a Wednesday. You're ready to play on a Saturday. Yeah. They don't really want to wait six, seven, eight years for a player. Everybody's so impatient in football. So. Because everybody's the cycle, they've all disappeared by the yeah. time that bears fruit, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, because rocket man, science. You know, there's that much of a change around a manager that he's thinking to himself, "Well, it's not really going to affect me because mm. chances are I'll be gone by the time." Uh, if I don't by, win by, enough you know, on a Saturday, yeah. then so so everything is very very short term focused from first team level, which makes it difficult for younger players to get in. What about players who are getting scouted from Ireland to come over to the? They might not be getting the opportunities in the teams, but is there still a nice yeah, stream of there players is, coming over? Yeah, there is, and there's some good players coming through. Ireland have, have, have done well recently at the Under-17 European Championships. They got to the quarterfinals and were knocked out by Holland on penalties who went on to win it. Uh, they, they were quite impressive, I thought. I thought they played really well. Uh, I know in the under 18s we've got you know we've got a lot of players kind of coming through as well who are decent. They'll move on to the under 19s where there's a tournament, um, a UEFA tournament, and that as well. So there's a healthy stream of players coming through, and there's you know there's a couple of standout players. One that I'd probably pick if if somebody was looking for me to pick one standout player would be a, a lad called Troy Parrott who plays for Tottenham. Uh, okay. He's only 16, nearly 17, and he's an excellent prospect. Uh, he was excellent at the under-17 tournament, and I know Mauricio Pochettino has taken uh, he's taken a, an interest in him, uh, and he's just signed a new contract at Tottenham. So he's definitely won that. The, um Ireland and Tottenham should be looking to for the future. I think Pochettino is the type of manager you would crave to have some youth coming through and in the first team. He's he's that type of character, yeah, isn't he? Well, he's probably he's one of the few be. managers that you would say, well, he's he's the one that is is prepared to put in that time with young players. But even he's become under a bit more pressure now, hasn't he, Jeff? This yeah. season, you know, <clears> he's um, shown it time and again with Southampton and Tottenham, though. And Kyle Walker goes, and two more are ready to come in almost straight away, like the ready-made players that you were saying about. So yeah, but when you say ready-made. Almost. They're, no, they're developed. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. developed. They're, we're not talking about these players that you bring yeah. in for fifty million to replace yeah, yeah. Kyle Walker, who's just left. You're talking about players who have been developed. Kieran Trippier spent what, just over a year as being an understudy, so to speak, to, yeah. to Kyle Walker. Credit to the lad himself, though, as well, oh, for absolutely. sticking that out. Listen, absolutely. You know, with agents I, and things nowadays, he obviously would have got offers to go elsewhere. Absolutely, and and I I think I thought them onto being crying crying when um, Kyle Walker left. No. They got fifty odd million from, and they will have looked at Kieran Trippy and said, "We've got a great replacement there. We believe in you." Now it's up to you to show it. Eh? And, and, and he's, and got he's a, gone. And he's gone under study it. underneath him in Walker Peters, isn't it? So. Yes. So that yeah, it's good for Spurs. It'll be interesting to see how they get on this season. Um, do you want to answer number seven? I'm a bit aware, Jeff. We're not bringing in you that much because being in chat, you know. Like old friends sometimes, don't we? And we go yeah. on and on. Um, to play at the highest level now, the professional demands are incredible. The game has poss possibly changed already since you retired, even though it was very recently. How different do you think it would be for a young Andy Reid if you were just starting as a professional now? Would you have to change? Which probably follows on really nicely from the last question. Or would you be happy to sit around on a bench for a season? We had a similar question from one of the kids. It was excellent earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give a young Andy yeah. Reid now? Could, you know, I mean, I'm talking pre-season. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. You know, could you get away with having two-week holiday without doing a thing? Nights no, out, no, your no, diet. You no, know, you, you couldn't. But but it was different then. You couldn't do it now. Yeah, that's you, you know, and and that's that. You know, that's the difference. It's the so if you were just starting sport, out now, sport, would, how would you have to change? Yeah, yeah, you would have to change. But so would. So would eighty percent of the players that I played with. So it's just all it's, it's relative just, it's just, compared yeah, to yeah, it's all relative. It's, it's, yeah. just, it's just different. Uh, what was what was done back then isn't isn't done now. Do you um, think you'd have enjoyed it more now, with the more professional it is, or are you quite happy uh, you were in that little part of the game as it was at the time? I've never really thought about yeah. it like that. If I'm being totally honest, which I was lucky enough. I had you know what. Uh, I played in a, in, a, in a really good area where there were some great characters. One thing that that I would say that that isn't as good about the modern era. When I say modern era, it makes me sound really, <laughs> no, really old. Ridiculous! It's only a few yeah. years since you retired. Um, but but what I would say about about now, I say I think there's a distinct lack of characters mm. in the game. Um, Why do you think that might was, be? There was loads of characters. I, I I I put it down to coaches and managers. I think a lot of coaches and managers are. Um, 
to put out a little bit by big characters and they don't really encourage them. I don't mm-hmm. think they're secure enough in themselves to have a big character and, and, and I think the game suffers from it a little bit. You know, technically everybody's great, everybody's fit, they run mm-hmm. around and it's brilliant, you know, and some of the quality of football is great to watch, but sometimes you like a good leader out there, a good character, somebody who, you know, has got something a little bit different and, and I think there's... there's there's not so many of them, and, and 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 they're a bit of a dying breed. Do you think some of that might be media training and being told what to say before you go in front of a camera, and it, uh, you don't get a gazer now, do you? Coming out and sticking yeah, his tongue out. Probably, yeah. I suppose there's different sorts of characters. Though. That's yeah. one type of character, and Roy Keane was a sort of another type yeah. of character. But... Yeah, I just think there's so many samey samey players now. You know, yeah. I, 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 you know, you just like so. I like to see somebody who has a little bit about them. When I'm coaching or when I see a player, I look at him and, OK, he might have decent ability or he might not have the same ability level as someone else, but I look at him and I go, yeah, you know what, you've got something about you. Mm. You know, when the chips are down, I can look at you and I know I can count on you. And that doesn't mean, to well, it does mean to go and win a tackle, to go and win a header, but it doesn't just mean that. It means, are you brave enough to have the ball? When your team are under the cosh or when you're 1-0 down, give me the ball, I'll create Moral something courage. for you. Right. Question number eight, then. We're not doing too badly here, Rido. Right. One of the things we are interested in right now is how do you recreate the intensity levels needed in training uh, or needed in matches to sort of replicate it. Um, We're obviously focusing on very young ones here, but even the under-23 league seems very technically pleasant on the eye, but looks like it lacks the intensity required. Do you see this as a problem? And again, you've got characters in there. You've already said, pleasing on the eye. It's very technically good, but it's not mm. yeah, very it's... intense. And then you, you get your chance in the first team, and it must be a massive step up from the under-23s. To... Yeah, it is. And I think it's probably the reason why, um, why players seem to be getting into force teams a lot later than what they have been doing. You know... I made my debut, I think I was 17 when I made my debut. I mean, the average age for somebody to probably make the debut has probably gone up to about 20, I would say. And there's players at the club, at clubs at 22, 23, who still haven't played in the force team. Yeah. And I find that really strange because, you know, I've, obviously because it was different, but, you know, being at a club in 23, you know, you should be in the force team in that force team or else you should be looking to go it's and play It's a strange thing that that happens else. or that these lads are actually prepared to let that happen, do you think? Is that the strange thing? That a, little happy... bit, a, little, a little bit of both, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be sitting around at a club if I was yeah. 21 and not playing. I mean, I was... I, I was You're like, a footballer, you want to play football. Right? Exa- yeah. Well, exactly. And listen, I went to Tottenham when I was... I was, well, so I was 21, 22, something like that. And uh, and I played for the first... Um, I played for the first six, seven months and then they went and signed a load of players and people like Edgar Davids and, and people like that and, and, and they were on a lot more money than me so there was a lot more pressure for them to play and, and I wasn't playing. So I was like, I'm at Tottenham but it doesn't matter, I want to go and play football. You could have stayed there, I presume. Of course, so I could have stayed there for your contract. Yeah, yeah. You know, I could have stayed but I wanted to go and play football. Uh, so... I think you'd never have been happy not playing football. No, I remember no. what you like when you were injured. Yeah, you yeah. absolute nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd better ask the next one because I think it's one of mine. It is. From chatting with you in the past, I know that Paul Hart was an important influence on your career. Can you tell us a little, more, a little bit more about him and who were your other big influences? I've written Bill Bezik here. I don't know if you work with him. but Yeah, I did work with Bill. Um, I worked with Bill. Uh, Paul Hart obviously was a massive influence. Yeah. My dad was a massive influence yeah. on me as well and he was, always, he was always very good because he was knowledgeable about football. Um, and he said it, it how it was, didn't he? he yeah, oh, yeah. Biggest critic. Yeah, yeah. But, also, but also forced to, to tell me when I'd done well. Yeah. You know, so so you need to, you need to get the balance. I worked with you know we talked about psychology earlier on. I worked with a psychologist when I was quite young, and then and then towards the end of my career as well, called Keith Mincher, okay. who has worked with uh, with Stuart Pearce and he's worked with uh, Steve Wigley, um, and 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 Paul Hart brought him in um, when when we were in the U team and then into the force team, and he was excellent. Helped helped me helped me a lot with my mentality when I was when I was younger. Um, helped me with my moods. Helped me with um, dealing with disappointment, um, dealing with tough times, and realizing when things are going well, why is it going well, and, and actually noting down what am I doing right here? Because it's easy to say when things aren't going well, oh, I need to change something, I need to mm-hmm. do. But when they are going well, 
look around and say, why, why am I doing? Why am I doing so well? What is contributing to me doing so well? Remember it and recreate it. Excellent, Jeff. Number ten. How important do you think it is for young players to have good role models as well as good coaches? It, it's listen. That's always been the case. You know, that's not something that's new. It's not something that's something that's been. Our, people, people react to, especially young players, react to the people around them. You react to the, to, the, to the coaches around them, to the other kids around them. So if you can create a good environment as a coach mm-hmm. and become a role model for them, and they look up to you, uh, and then they try and recreate that, then all of a sudden you find within a group. You know, they they start rubbing off on each other, and they all want to be that person. They all want to be that leader. They all want to be that role model, and you create a fantastic working environment and a fantastic environment for learning and for improvement. Is this what Paul Hart did very very well? Create an environment, like you said earlier, to express yourself. To, I think a better question might be: How important is it to help you on and off the pitch? Would be a better question. Than that yeah, well, well, listen, it's very, very important, and and, that, and that's Especially one of the young lad well, this is one of the reasons why Paul had was was so good for me, was because uh, not just for me, for all of us, he insisted that like if, if we were walking across the car park, seeing somebody that worked in in the club, and and if any of the lads was in in any way not polite to this lady or gentleman, uh, then you know we would get a hell of a dressing down, you yeah. know. You know everybody's name. Be polite to them. Be good values and ethics. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. you know. And he was very, very big on that. And then take it onto the pitch and be the same on the pitch. Uh, And and he he also was very, very keen. And I'm very, very keen on it as well. Still, and it probably stems from that is respect the environment that you're working in. So if you've got a training ground or you've got a facility that you're training at, and you see a piece of rubbish on the floor, don't just leave it there. Go and pick it up. This is this is our working environment. So respect it and uh, and nurture it and, and help it become a great environment for us all to learn. So all these things, are values and morals, respect, um, and they work hand in hand with what happens off the pitch and on the pitch. It's something we're massive on, isn't it, Geoffrey? Call it like the one percent. It might not yeah. picking that bit of rubbish up might not make you a better footballer, but you add all those ethics and morals together. One percent all add up to the character that you're, you you develop and you become, which you can take into your football. Yeah, very much so. The Inner Huddle from Peza Street Soccer.